Hey everybody, how are you? I hope that you're doing well wherever you are in the world. If you're watching the recording, please hit subscribe so that you get notified of the next live video. Today we are going to be talking about generics, which is kind of this kind of weird, scary uh, thing if you've only used like JavaScript or Python. Uh, and if you've, you know, and it's this kind of weird, horrible concept if you, let's say, are a Go programmer uh, you've been hurt. You've been hearing about this generics thing for a long time. It sounds very intimidating, and I'm here to show you that I was going to say that it's not, but it might be intimidating. But it's definitely something that's worth learning about because it's extremely powerful. I'm hopeful that I can demystify this for you. So let's get going. Uh, and how are we going to get going? <laughs> What about with a very blank canvas? So I'm going to start a new project and I'm going to be calling this um, reporting. Uh, maybe we want to call it, yeah, we'll just call it report reporting. So here is our project. Uh, we've got a hello world and it's a, let's say hello internet. Uh, by the way, if you, oh, I have to CD, I'll go into my reporting, oh, reporting uh, directory, and then I run cargo run, and it should compile and I get hello world, that's very odd, maybe I didn't click save, control S to save it, run again, hello internet, and I'll just quieten this down by writing the dash Q, and then I just get the output from the compiler. Uh, if you are in the comments, please say hi. Uh, is um, is the screen legible? I'm just checking for audio. <laughs> uh, and um, I'm liking that people are excited about the music. I'm trying to kind of add a little bit of dynamism to the stream. And I'm definitely thinking about uh, some adding some of um, Ferris in there as well. Really cool. So. Uh, let's go. Oh, there's one other thing that I should tell you. If you are interested in catching, uh, following up with, or like if connecting with me, uh, we have a discord that I would really encourage you to participate in and I'll just get the link. Uh, I'm just off screen at the moment. I'm just frantically trying to find this link for you and then we'll kind of get going. Actually, while I get that going, I'm going to start with uh, oh, no no here we go I've got my I'm getting my a creating my invitation uh, it's only valid for seven days so uh, if you are here from if you are watching the recording um, do hit follow and then hopefully you'll be able to uh, get a new invite uh, later on if you are brand new you know that's excellent okay cool let's get to work uh, 
what is our task? Our task is to actually, uh, we want to print something to the screen. So I've got a message here. And my message says, uh, uh, is status, status operational. And let's say actually that I want to, I've got a function report status and I want to pr print the message to the screen. This kind of may seem kind of trivial. We just saw printing to the screen just then with our hello internet example, uh, but it will get more complicated. So to start off with, we need to create a function. Uh, And this will be our message, or let's just say, that, so that we don't use the same variable name twice, let's say our internal variable will be called report and its type will be of uh, a string slice, which looks like an ampersand and then str. So an ampersand is a reference. So we would take a string slice is a reference to a stir which is a string of bytes. Um, <clears throat> we can blame computer scientists for using the word string um, when they mean text. There is There are some kind of weird reasons for that. Uh, by the way, uh, this is another way for me to be able to create, uh, to compile the code and to run it. In my editor, I can actually just click run, um, but we'll go back to where I started with and run control, cargo run. Um, Q, and it's like, oh, we are operational. Okay, so now I want to use, I'll just run again so we get the, we add the new line. So adding LL, LN just then, I just add a new line. Now I want to change things. I would like a second message. So this is my second two, uh, message two, and this is actually going to be a string and it's also going to be created from a string slice. I'm sorry for the uh, I'm sorry that there is a difference in Rust between a string and a string slice. They, the string literal type is actually a different type than a capital string, uh, capital S string. Um, this is something that you will become quite used to. You can see that my editor has given me a warning that this won't work. Uh, we've got here, we expect an ampersand stir. We expect a string slice, but actually we found a string. And then we get this really interesting message. You should consider borrowing. Okay, so we'll try that. Let's see what this does. So this is actually adding an ampersand. Uh, and then we get our two status messages. We, our first one is operational, our second one, we've got an error. Now, what adding a reference to a string does is change the type that is being sent into report status. So effectively, we kind of get like a hidden type coercion in there, or like a, we kind of, kind of, uh, so that's one way that we can subtly add some behavior, and it's with referencing. Uh, it turns out that this is going to sound really confusing, so I apologize for that. Types can define their behavior when they are dereferenced. So let's say that you are a function report status, and you are given a reference to a stir, which is, or a reference to a slice of bytes. The, the type stir actually gets to decide what is on the other side of the reference. Uh, I'm going to, ex and it turns out that when a string is dereferenced, it presents the same data as a stir. So they can kind of masquerade as the same type. Uh, let me explain what I mean by pulling up the standard libraries documentation. Uh, I'll just need to open an editor and so I've got the Rust standard library here, and I will hunt for 
<clears throat> the DREF trait. It's actually in the standard OPS, which stands for operation or is short for operation, DREF. And it turns out that the target is not necessary, which is the re end result. Uh, if T implements DREF target equals U, that means that T can convert itself into U. So what you sometimes get with Rust is kind of this hidden type coercion. It looks like we're sending two types into the same function, but uh, they are magically kind of changing themselves um, underneath you. But we can actually do better. <clears throat> what we we'll want to be able to do is change something. Uh, we want to change report status to be able to take, kind of like if I use, say, some imaginary syntax. What I want is to be kind of have like a st type, let's say, uh, type text equals a string or a string slice. Now this type doesn't actually exist. This isn't valid Rust syntax, but I would like to create something that takes either a string or a string slice. Uh, how do we do that? And we do that with generics. So a generic type is typically given a single letter as a type variable. So this is not a variable relating to data, it's a variable relating to data types. It's an indicator that report status can have multiple data types given to it. And we are going to constrain T by saying that anything that uh, implements the display trait, oops, that's not spelt correctly, uh, yeah, okay, so it's saying I can't find him, I can't find the display trait in local stroke. And uh, so we actually need to use it from standard format or FMT and display. I, uh, I, the Rust compiler, will accept this. And in fact, I will create two versions of report status. So this is a different, it looks like we're doing the same thing as what we just did. Uh, there is no longer an ampersand in the before message two, and it turns out that the string, <clears throat> uh, that there are actually two types going sent into the same function. At least inside the source code, it looks like the same function. It turns out that the compiler creates two copies. So you can imagine that the compiler might have decided, so what the compiler sort of does is uh, create uh, report status string, uh, let's say like this, and now this is a very boring way to do it. Apologize if you know, if this is extremely simple for you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, so that will work just fine. And so this one is this. What the compiler is effectively doing is duplicating all of the code and creating two functions. Uh, this is a, a bit of a problem because it thinks that Rust's internal system doesn't really like functions that have capital letters inside them. Uh, but it, and so it's giving me a warning, but it will still work. <clears throat> it's exactly the same thing as what Rust is doing under the hood. Whew, okay, now, <laughs> but there's more. So we've uh, shrunk the source code to a single function that accepts multiple arguments. It can accept more. So if we use a special one, uh, I'll use a different uh, text type called the copy on write, which is often returned by functions that want to be able to return a string with a capital S and the stir uh, string slice. Now it's in standard borrow copy on write shortens uh, is <laughs> a cow. And in fact, I am just going to copy this across. And if I say message three, and I can probably create it simple. It amazes, oh. <laughs> so um, we've just had a comment saying, I can't believe you're doing it this fast, <laughs> which is really nice to see. Um, I always think of myself as a ridiculously slow programmer. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, so message three, I, if I take message two and then I clone it, I get another string, which is 
sort of fine. Uh, but actually, I want to create a cow. So I say cow from message from from a copy, uh, and I'm going to bring it up here before we call report status for the second time for reasons that uh, relate to ownership that I wish to defer while I convince you that I can get three uh, types being printed out by one function. Great. Uh, actually, I'm just going to, yeah, so we've got two error messages and one operational message. It's a bit sad, you know, our story is, um, you know, our ship is, is breaking. <laughs> it's like, obviously, clearly something's gone wrong. Um, but let's move ahead, <laughs> shall we? So here's our, here are our messages, there are, there's our reporting. Uh, we've actually come far, quite far with this display thing. Now this is a bit of an issue because I say, what is display? Uh, what, what, as you saw me do by hand, one way to implement generics is to say that I will create a copy of the function and duplicate it for every specific type. Now, Rust has a, oh, it's a, it comes from C++ actually, monomorphization, which is the, like, it's, a, it's an utter abuse of English. Uh, we have mono, so a singular, it's probably Greek actually, morph change. So we somehow change into multiple, we start with something that's generic and we create multiple duplicates that have a specific type. Uh, we can do, we've got some other patterns that I really want to show you. Um, the reason why I spent so long on this one is that it is most common. It all, one thing I haven't really described is like what on earth is a trait? Uh, everything hinges on the ability for you to describe the traits. Uh, for example, we could, I'm just going to say like as ref stir, just going to change reporting somewhat uh, for fun. Now we're saying that T is no longer display, that is it doesn't know how to display, it doesn't respond to these curly braces. Instead it must implement as ref stir, which is if you remember right back to the start of the stream, if there is a reference and <clears throat> I dereference it, it masquerades as a stir. That's what string is doing. And that's also what cow does. So in order to access this behavior, I need to actually call as reference. So I've got a T and I need, <clears throat> I need it to like cast its magic spell, which is to become a reference and then masquerade as a stir. This should work, he says. <laughs> we, uh, Russ is going to complain, you no longer use display, so why why have you bothered with that? Um, there, you may wonder why it is that as ref we don't need to include locally, so I could say use standard, and I have no idea where it is, uh, is there a module ref? If I just add as ref, it, where is it? I could look in the docs, here I'll look in, oh, that's the wrong uh, thing. Uh, brr. as ref is within this what we call the standard preload so so inside the standard mo module there are three currently three different versions of rust and the versions the wrong word sorry three editions of rust each edition has its own preload uh, and so those are automatically brought into the scope of the program when it is compiled that's how we have string type without needing to import it directly. Okay, I did promise you some more tricks and allow me to kind of get my cheat sheet um, so that I can get you some more information. That's the wrong page again. I will, I'm uh, just, do, 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 what am I doing? Uh, 
Ah, that was not supposed to go. Oh, I found it. Good. Here we go. Cool. <laughs> Apologize for this. Just imagine you just kind of just skip over the last 30 seconds. I hopefully it wasn't too bad. Uh, we've got display. Oh, there's another way of doing it. We can also ask for uh, actually, yeah, I'll just explain another way of sort of implementing exactly the same thing. Or at least it looks like it's doing exactly the same thing. It's a, it's another, what we're asking is a different form of magical power. So I am the report status function and I can accept any type T that is able to be converted into a string. And we still get exactly the same output. I want to actually go back and so we had as ref and what happens if we go as ref uh, utf8 and this one oh actually it's into so we haven't changed the data that is sent in we've just changed its type signature we've got received a compiler warning and saying oh that's not very good it, uh, that doesn't in fact none of them work uh, but I wonder if I can force them to do so. I just, I, what I wanted to show you was that I can actually extract, I can, uh, I can access the raw bytes. I wonder if I can, no, maybe I'll just stop playing and I'll go on to the next part. Now I want to show you how to avoid some of the cost associated with monomorphization that is creating duplicates through oh as mute isn't even a thing as ref stir oh i should stop playing okay now it compiles and my ear most of my ears go away uh gosh can you tell that i'm sweating i can definitely tell that i'm sweating Okay, now we need to, we're going to go for a different strategy, which is this thing called a trait object. Now, hopefully I'm not going to lose you here. I'm going to explain it to you. I'm just thinking uh, sort of at the top of my head. I'm, instead of doing it the conventional way, we're going to do it the kind of interesting way to kind of hopefully, uh, hopefully kind of cause your brain to scratch a little bit and it might be a bit fun okay right so the we've got our report now what we're going to add a special case uh what if our, our text is empty now if it's empty I want to add some default value. <laughs> I kind of wanted to say that uh, I wanted this thing is like no valid message. Uh, or let's say like uh, warning. Oh, invalid. I should stop playing. You know, like there was some corruption in the trend in the data feed. Otherwise, I'll just fall back to the text. And I kind of, uh, if you are familiar with um, with Rust, you will understand that actually I can return back from a, a conditional expression, or like this if can actually return a value. So I'm just gonna overload text again and then I'll print it out. And for whatever reason, my third message is going to be empty. And we'll see if this does what I think it might. 
I need to change it in order for it to be interesting. So these are intentionally at the moment exactly the same type. So at the end of as ref, I have converted whatever it is that came in into a string slice. So this both versions of text uh, of the text variable are string slices. Now, just to be difficult, I'm going to turn it into a string uh, because I want to be difficult. <laughs> For whatever reason, I'm inside some function and I need to be able to handle like dynamic types inside one block of code. Now you may have heard that Rust is a statically compiled language. It can't, it's got no dynam dynamism. Dynamism. <laughs> and you would be right. Uh, well, well, but there's, it has a trick. Um, I'm going to create a new variable with a sort of an, like a trailing underscore just so that it's very obvious, or at least it, uh, that I'm talking about something else. And now I want to uh, add, introduce some new syntax, which is the dyn dynamic uh, uh, thing. Uh, sorry, the thing. <laughs> Keyword. <laughs> and display is our friend display that we actually uncommented. Oh, so we commented it out again. My editor kindly brought it back into scope, but I'll take it away. Uh, we've almost got a compiler warning. And the reason why that is, is because I actually over here on line seven asks for a reference. And so I need a reference there. And I also need a reference here. Text with no underscore. So what is defined in line six is a string. Oh. Text with an underscore is a trait object. A trait object is something which can uh, take the input. Oh, a trait object is able to what's a good way of expressing what a trait object is a trait object can uh, be any type at runtime as long as it implements what it is that it promises to implement um, so rust uses some runtime indirection to implement this behavior it ticks with an underscore is some type that implements display and what does it mean to implement display if we go through its documentation it is able to it by definition has a format method that knows how to do the right thing and so what rust ends up doing is calling format on this text underscore object and whichever the concrete type is it turns out it works fine because they all implement display. This is checked at compile time, but the actual type is defined at runtime. I'm going to pause there and allow questions to come through. Um, uh, do you have any questions? <laughs> The horrible thing is I've actually lost you. Ah, there's the my window. So we've had a few questions about what cow was. So this was a while ago. What what is cow again? <laughs> and we had some really good answers, which is um, copy on write. Uh, it will if you attempt to modify the um, the input. Oh, the contents of, of copy and write, you get a duplicate. Uh, if you don't touch it, it stays very memory efficient. Ah, okay. Traits are interfaces, or are they something more? So this is like a ridiculously good question. Traits, and I'm going to just write it up here. So like, uh, traits, just interfaces. 
they are more powerful than most implementations of interfaces. The terms are very slippery in computer science. Every programming language community seems to have their own definitions. Uh, I would, so there's the question. Um, my answer is uh, yes, they are. No, 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 my answer is no, they are more powerful. Um, traits can have associated constants and values. Uh, values is a bit picky. They can have associated types. Uh, which makes more sense if I look at the definition of a type, uh, of a trait. And I will do so by pulling up the Rust documentation. So here is a web browser and if I go to um, standard, I can try and find some module. Let's find clone. So here we go, the clone trait is for types that cannot be implicitly copied. So they are in some sense more expensive to copy than copy. <laughs> now the trait is here. The trait defines two methods, clone and clone from. Other traits are more complex. And so, the, so clone takes some a reference to some object and returns another object that is have the same type. Uh, clone from takes something else, uh, a mutable reference to an object that is being cloned and uh, something else. Oops, that was a bit of a mangled way to say. Uh, copy assignment from source. Uh, clone from B is equivalent to A equals B clone. Interesting. I actually never use clone from, so I apologize for um, messing that up. Um, you can think of, um, <clears throat> so some ways to think of type traits as um, abstract base classes. Mixins. Um, I'm just going to write this down. Other ways to think of traits. Abstract base classes, mixins, uh, and there's one other term. Uh, you could just, yeah, use interface. The difference between, I think, uh, this isn't, I haven't verified this, I really should. The one distinct difference with traits versus interfaces is that Interfaces avoid the problem with what was called the diamond problem in C++, where you have multiple inheritance. Rust has no inheritance hierarchy, uh, and traits enable you to be able to, in essence, get the benefits of multiple inheritance without the downsides. Mm, that's an unsophisticated answer. And I am going to think about how to answer it better, but it's the best I could do right for the moment. Okay, we've just had a really good question, um, which is, can you recap DYN or DIN, DYN? Short for dynamic. Okay. I will do so. I wonder, I wonder... Um, it actually never really existed until early Rust. Oh, sorry, latish Rust. So if I try and compile this code, we get an error. Trait objects must include the DYN keyword and that you should add it if you want to for it to work. Now I'm just going to be sneaky and change the addition to 2015. Um, now, it is saying that it was a compiler warning and the code operates uh, it does actually work just fine and it is accepted in 2015 but it becomes a hard error in Rust 2021 so we'll make it a hard error again the reason why I wanted to show you that was this is mostly a hint to you 
the U is the programmer. The compiler does not need this keyword. Uh, what it is trying to say, to signify to you, is that we are creating a trait object. So instead of text underscore being a concrete type, it is some abstract type that can implement display. So all Rust knows of text underscore is that it is able to call the format method of disk, which is defined inside display. And uh, the reason that works is they all implement exactly the same trait. And so uh, if you know about how computer programming languages are implemented, it just becomes a, uh, a pointer to, uh, yeah, it, it just becomes a, a function pointer that all of the specific types can actually share because they all have exactly the same function signatures because they all implement the same trait. Uh, so it turns out that every concrete type can share the same function calls. This is a way of uh, speeding up, well, no, 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 of shrinking the size of your binary because you no longer need to duplicate everything. But it uh, does have a cost, which is at runtime, we need to kind of do what is called dynamic dispatch. Um, and I want to just expand a little bit more about one of the other ways that we can, we can kind of, so we just described this as having a problem that is your, uh, of this duplication. There is one more piece of the puzzle that I want to describe. I can have a, a generic function that's very general. So that uh, I can accept any type and I'm going to change it again to any type which implements two string. So T is now, and so this report variable can be any type that has a two string method. All right, it implements two string, which in reality is a, uh, it means that they have a two underscore string method. Now, once, but I also want to be able to avoid the duplicate or the triplication of this function when it is called from multiple types. So one of the things that I can do is have an, like a sneaky inner function that only takes a concrete type. And in this case, it's going to take a, um, it's going to take a string slice. And this string slice is where the printing is going to happen. Oh, I wonder if I've done that right. Uh, I don't know if I have. I wonder. Let me, no, no, no. I... Oh no, no, well this is fine, this, this is probably going to work. But this won't have all the benefits that I wanted of... Maybe it will. So you can see, you could just imagine, oh this one is the wrong trait there. And it's the wrong type, so... Okay, I've only got two, and in fact, well, I have it, the third line still exists, but I took away the uh, my empty section. I wonder if I can bring that back just for fun. Um, I've got R for my little dis my little report.
It's quite a complicated, quite a complicated kind of piece of code that we've got here. What I'm trying to do is have a function that is cheap to copy three times because it's got this, we've defined it inside. So it's sort of, it looks like an inner function. Uh, but it doesn't need to be defined inside internally. I'll just verify that by running it again. So the lines 13 to 20 are compiled once. Lines 23 through 25 are compiled as many, uh, three times in our case, because we uh, apply three types. Let's say, so that's a third part of, uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so that's a third way we can uh, provide some kind of dynamism. We can provide generic code um, without incurring a lot, all of all of the compile time size cost. Uh, as long as we're willing to trade off a little bit of runtime cost for this dynamic dispatch. In fact, the dynamic dispatch isn't necessary. So now we can just avoid that here. And then we have a marginal cost of an extra function call. Uh, you can think, um, if you know a little bit about programming languages, we can, <laughs> the compiler might inline this uh, because it's so trivial. Um, so we can actually add a, a an annotation which says, please don't, um, please keep it small. And this will tell the compiler that it should always execute the function and not to just copy out its contents, this print line method into the inner function. Okay, cool. I've actually kind of gone through a lot of the content that I wanted to go through tonight a little bit faster than I thought I would. Um, so feel free to ask me any other questions. Otherwise I can just push, I suppose, pause there. Oh, I've even, I'm doing the wrong setting on my stream. So sorry if you've, <laughs> been unable to read what I've been saying. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any further questions. Um, otherwise, I will wrap up. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to, because I cannot stand the silence, I'm just going to put on a little bit of background music for some kind of ambiance. Uh, here we go. <laughs> How'd that go? Nice. I'm taking that as a good sign. I'm first time I'm seeing Rust and holy shit, I'm understanding half of this. I like it. That um that's that's really great to hear actually i mean rust is really intimidating the idea is that you uh it's this kind of statically compiled language and that if you've only done um i don't know whatever it is you've just done php or something it can feel really intimidating but hopefully i can have demonstrated that it, it is kind of accessible and it is really fun uh, and also your programs run really really fast <laughs> okay it looks like we're not getting a lot of um extra comments so i am going to wrap up i will share my discord link again just for fun like i i really want to be able to invite people to hang out and ask questions i just need to go and get it i should have all of these things kind of sorted out um, i'm planning to do some more streaming 
I am really curious as to what you would like. Um, is this a format that these kind of tutorials, um, are they useful? What, what is it that you want to know? <laughs> because like, I'm here to, I'm here to help. Hey, good night to you too. Thanks very much for hanging out. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone, or good morning. <laughs> Take care.